Keeper. Let's go. Just gonna fire off. Just gonna go combat first. Question is, do I bring this to hand? Or do I play this now? Interesting, interesting decision here. I think I'll bring this to hand. Play this for one man on the next turn, I'll play Agadim's Awakening. Play Lurus. We are listening to Harry in the background, by the way. Jeez. Okay. Harry, Harry. We're, We're listening to Harry 13 in the background, which the is Martin, actually. Um, we'll be starting shortly here. Just waiting for some people to show up. Three cards in the graveyard. You know, um, get some traction going. And then I'll start uh, talking wish, a lot. I wish, I wish, Just I wish I had a basic island. I really wish I had a basic I'm going to harass how I'm Martin a bit. So. I'll pay for you, like. Play the Lurus, maybe draw out the Storm, draw two. We're doing this in response, interesting. Interesting, and we've drawn some removal. More drowns, not the worst. False drop beast, yep, draw two cards. Mm -hmm. For a beast that loves struck, you hate to see it. Play this. Ah. So that's one. We need to go to. Facebook, just to update. Probably kill one of these. Bring this back. Hold up, drone. Again, part of the just now. Yeah, I think I'll do this. See if they will trade. Okay, let's do this. I'm not taking the bait. Let's do this. <laughs> Can't read that. Yeah, what's up, Raheem? <laughs> awesome to see you 5 0 today. You're crushing it, buddy. Well, when you play Magic, you know, some of us don't need practice, right? Just just pick up pick up a deck, just 5 0, right? Who needs that? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I'm gonna be starting really soon, but um, as you said, this is um, it's your yeah, yeah, I know, I know, it's your it's your abomination, I would say. I mean, I love it. Like seeing you play, the thi like the thing that really popped to my mind is that like if you put if you put a good player with Uro, Cryptic Command, Field of the Dead, and like a bunch of other blue cards, it's just gonna work. That's why I was like talking, like, you know, making fun of like Sean Uro. Because I honestly think like it doesn't really matter what you put around that card. As long as you play to like a bit of interaction, Field of the Dead, and like decent mana, right? That card is just so insane. <laughs> mm. Almost forgot, yeah. I mean, but like, you're doing good. Your list looks really tight. You know what you're doing. This is like the most important thing, right? Which is super, super sweet. Oh yeah. Just a second here and I'll be right with you. So like, feel free anyone, if you have any questions or you want me to talk about a specific subject, you want us to talk about a specific subject, just like, let us know in the chat. We would love that. And basically it's gonna be like, me talking a bit about like yeah. the background of the WMC and then our is gonna join and we're just gonna talk about like the experience, the event itself. It was just so so sweet. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think we have a lot of space to explore, right? I think I mean if you even just like 
look uh, yeah, at... Uh, oh, this is not German what I wanted. Champion. We needed that. Oh, they did make a mistake here. So, yeah, the thing is... Um, as I said, I think in Pioneer right, let's 2... Let's do this. Let's meet the teams at the World Magic Cup. Here's Luis Salvato, the reigning player... I think in, um, in Pioneer 2, like, people were not building Omnath correctly, and this wasn't really explored. And now the deck is exploding, because people realize that, like, Uro and Omnath are just busted. Like, they would win you the game through almost anything. Especially now when we don't have, like, true combo in Pioneers, except, off, except from... Um, Lotus Field, right? So I do think that like it's gonna see an uptick, and I kind of want Pioneer to get shaken up. I hope maybe Kaldheim with like the better mana is gonna do that, right? Um, it's just me hoping though. So I wanted to write that. Yeah, I need to update this on my Discord. As we continue backwards, well, who's next? It's Canada and Chile. Here's the Chileans, Patricia Roman back again. And that man you'll recognize in the blue shirt, that's Alexander Hain. A hundred percent of the time that he's captain Canada, they've advanced to day two of this competition. Oh, I should. You believe it, a great team. They most yeah. certainly are. Next, China and Chinese Taipei opposite each other here on the Magic the Gathering Battlefield. PPA uh, in the middle there for Chinese Taipei. I'm going to come on round here and who's next? Let's take a look okay. at Colombia and... Oops, Costa. yeah, oops is combo, but like, the thing is, Omnath easily beats oops because... So imagine like Omnath slows Oops down by a turn, right? And Oops combos on turn four. At this point, like the Omnath player can just go ahead and be like, okay, I'll play Omnath, fetch land, gain four, crack it, escape into the wild, or like Uro, gain three more, survive your attack, untap again. And then at this point, they like can just go off and you can't kill them. Like they're just gonna block your creatures. And then they're gonna go way over the top of you, and and you can't win unless you get like a really specific, like you can mill them with like informer and haunted dead or stuff. But that's like not really happening most of the time. So the the matchup feels really, really, really difficult. Yo, sir, how are you doing? <laughs> Thank you for dropping by. We're gonna be um. So basically, we're um, I just put in the background the video of like the introductions in the WMC. This was during deck building for sealed so we're gonna talk a bit in a bit about like what was the format and what we were doing but basically you can see like autumn burchett here and you can see we saw salvado before and this is Mangucci in the background so like wc wmc is like insanely stacked usually um not as much as a pt but there are like a bunch of really good players because by definition one of the players on the team the captain is like a pro player right so that makes the whole experience like amazing. This is Christian Hawk. Like when I got there, this is the pro. No, Rabe, it does not exist. How long have you been playing Magic, Rabe? That you like not not no no attacking or anything. I'm just wondering because the WMC it has existed in this form since 2012, and this was the last one. This is Arnaud. He's gonna be joining us soon. This is the French team, obviously. Uh, the winners of the event. Spoiler. Is this just a second here? Custom jackets as well for them. And then the Greeks, led by Makis Mavis. Oh, this is the Greeks, okay. Are former World Magic Cup champions. Yeah, so basically, so um, 2018 was the last time this event was ran. They announced, like, the MPL and the Mythic Championships, I think, like, a week before this event happened or something, right? And, like, a bunch of players here, like, Depra and Shenhar, both of which, like, Shenhar was on Israel team and Depra on the French team. And they both, like, um... No, they have not, sir. Just a second. We're gonna, gonna say that soon. I don't remember, by the way, I don't remember this happening. Like, I literally have no recollection of Rich Hagen, like, standing on top of me and being like, this is Team Israel. I don't remember that spot. <laughs> so, basically, this was the last event and everyone knew that. Like, it was on the table, so this was really special. Um... Really felt like um, it was a special occasion, like a last chance to, to... Yeah, maybe we could... 
Like if we do this, maybe it's better. I think it's just like the quality here though. I don't like I think it's the quality of the coverage itself. This is me. Okay, so let's do this. Murphy, great job by them. And now Israel. We see at the back yeah. there. There's two time world champion, Shahar Shen. So this is me, this is Shahar, this is Yuval, Yuval Zuckerman. We're building our silly pool, which was actually kind of insane. Um, and then next to the e like Team Italy, and for me, you know, I never qualified for a PT before this. Never qualified for anything big before this other than like nationals. So like getting to meet all these pros, getting to play with Shahar, getting to meet Minguchi, getting to play Carvalho, like I actually played against Carvalho is kind of insane. So, you know, let's go ahead and um, and start the rants, right? Um, I'm gonna start by talking a bit about what the WMC is and what the format was. We already mentioned this a bit, and yeah, it was, it was, yeah. yeah. It's this basically a hype stream, but for something that happened in the past, which uh, I think is sweet. <laughs> uh, you can find all the videos, by the way, um, in this link. Oh wait, I sent all the links. Never mind, that's good enough. Um, oh, I didn't send all the links. Just a second here. Let me still struggling with the format here. Oh yeah, this is like these are the videos if you want to check them out. This is where I'm playing from. So basically, WMC World Magic Cup is what replaced the World Team Championship. Basically, the World Magic Cup consists of a team of three players from each country. Usually around 70 to 80 countries. I think we were like 72 or 78, can't remember exactly. Um, countries sending the teams that are made of, as I said, three members. The first one is the team captain. This is the player from that nation, from that like country, which had the most pro points that year. So for some countries, it's actually a race. We had Musi from Sweden tell us in another stream about how, like, Joel Larson and Elias something I think like competed for like captaincy and it came up to like top eighting a GP or something. This is for some countries. For Israel, we basically have one big pro player, and that's Shahar Shenhar. Shahar is two times world champion, um, multiple like times PT competitor. I think he won like eight GPs or something, or top eight eight GPs or something. Like Shahar is extremely good and by far the best Israeli players of all time. So he's the captain. He's been the captain for the entire time the WMC was ran, or maybe from the second year. So like at least six years as a captain, right? And then the other two players come from the national championships. Those players are the national champion and the runner-up. And for 2018, I was fortunate enough to be able to win my nationals, to win the Israeli nationals, and I'm actually still Israeli national champion because no one has ever taken that title from me and they never will. So, so these are the teams, right? And then the teams compete in this event that is spread over three days. Yeah, that was... Um, that is a story in and of itself. I mean, winning the national championships is really was a dream come true because I top aided them like a couple of times, and and that was like my biggest goal, right? That's a decent rag. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just just put it on the CV, right? In the championship, um, in the national championship, I was playing, I actually should have the photo right here. Just a second, I, I think I have that here. Um, I think it's actually this, hopefully this is, yeah. I was playing this, this amazing deck. You can't see anything probably, but it's like Glintsev, Siphoner, Champion of Wits. This care of God, like push, contempt, a braid. This was basically Greek's midrange. Yeah, basically Greek's midrange. Um, such a sweet deck. I loved it so much. Um, got to use Greek's energy to like win a PPTQ, and then I fell in love with the Siphoner. And no, that's not JVP. This is Argul's Bloodfest. Do you know that card? Bloodfest is uh, Bloodfest is one of the in most interesting cards I got to play. Like the the combo, like the I think one of the weirdest things about this deck is that. Um, oh no, you're here! Yeah, 12 GPs top eight, 
Four wins. Or no, he's gonna be joining us soon. He's with me in chat. <laughs> yeah, Bloodfest was actually MVP versus um, Rakdos Aggro, right? Rakdos Aggro was like, you, or Mono Red Aggro too, because you got to flip it. And then once you flip it, you could sack your Scarab God like every turn to gain five life. And that would just win you the game. That was mental. Um, anyway, we're, we're, we need to stay focused, chat. We need to stay focused. So, WMC, as we said. So the format was, as I said, Team Seal. Oh, I didn't say it actually. So three days of magic, right? Day one, all our, all the teams are competing and we're playing Team Sealed. Now, Team Sealed, each team gets 12 booster packs, right? And it need needs to be three decks, including cyborgs. Now, this might sound like a bit underpowered to you if you never played the format because you know in a pre you usually end up getting like six packs and five packs I think in like GPs and stuff but in in like in fact this format was probably more powerful than like the decks were more powerful than like your average draft deck right because once you see so many cards and you can just like split them between three decks um the decks end up reading like the pools end up being really really deep and you can be like really focused strong decks so this was the format for day one any team that got to four wins Qualified for day two, the teams that didn't were this like finished their tournament. I think like 40 teams made it through from day one to day two. Now, day two was team unified standard, which is a really awesome format where you need to be you need to submit three different decks. You need to build three different submit three different decks that can't share any card other than basic land cards, which means basically that which means that um. You can't like you can't even split sideboard cards, right? You can't play two path to exiles in one deck and two path to exiles in another deck. Just as a as an example, you have to like decide which one deck gets to use it, which makes the constraints of the format really interesting. Although it ended up, the format ended up being such that it wasn't that big of a restriction because like the top four or five decks, you could easily you could easily pick like three of them that wouldn't like have any any um cards that like share with each other yeah, and every so costume, the format for day two is interesting it was double elimination well, two times uh, so biased. you played three rounds and you needed to win two of those rounds to move on to the next stage and if you won in like stage two then you got to the top eight. so this was a clean cut no breakers no nothing top eight like tournament the sets um it was just after ravnica was released I don't actually remember what sets we had. Um, and you sat down with it was. A bit earlier to give us an let me check that for a second. World Magic. Let's find out who they are. Cup 18. Hey oh yeah. So the format was standard for sure. Like that's like that's the format. Trying to figure out like what was, what were the actual sets we were playing. No, this is not what we need. So it was just after Ravnica was released, right? And then let's take a look at one of the decks. You know what? Let's just do this. Oh my God, sir, you're you you're making me uh, you're surprising me with this question. So we had um, so this is like um, I can't remember Ixalan. We had both Ixalan sets, right? This is not Jumpstart. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I'm kidding. And we had um, Guilds of Ravnica. Just released. This was like the newest set. This is what we played with um, in like the sealed pools, right? And then, and then we had um, a corset. Maybe we. I think we had corset nineteen, right? Because Carnage Tyrant is from. Lanroff is now from there. I'm not sure. I even played a card from corset nineteen here. Carnage Tyrant was maybe in... Maybe our knock can save us. Okay, Ixalan rivals Dominaria Corset. Oh, Dominaria is what I'm missing, yeah. And Return to Ravnica. It's Guilds of Ravnica, right? It's Ravnica, City of Guilds, or... Because we saw that one... In Fine Finale, right? It was, yeah, Guilds of Ravnica, right? 
piece here to represent it. So that was the format. We had Ixalan, Rivals of Ixalan, Dominaria, the Corset 19, if I recall correctly. No. Corset... Which corset was that? And Gives of Ravnica. So the, the standard format was actually like... Arena? Was Arena running? I didn't play Arena until like a month ago, so I don't know, actually. I think it was just announced. I think it was like beta, yeah, exactly. It was beta, and then it was like, they just announced like the Mythic Championships and like stuff going on to Arena and things like that. Like, as I said, MPL announcement was like actual MPL starting, like um, the, the announcement about the MPL being a thing happened like a week or two weeks before this event. So it was really, really new. It was like just before the big changes to organized play. So the standard format was actually like the smallest format you can have, like just after, after rotation where you get only one new set and you rotate like three or four out. So the format ended up being like relatively low powered. I mean, if you take a look at, so this was like the best deck in the format was like explore creatures and wild of walker and like a bunch of me like planeswalkers that like dirtle around and find finality and like the best card in the format was like carnage tyrant which is not exactly high powered compared to what we've seen like the following years um so the format really felt like grindy magic you had to play like really tight you had long games going on and no deck was like super powerful everything was relatively similar in like power level so the format was really sweet, and as I said, like we're gonna take a look at the decks in a minute. Basically, um, but basically the decks were pretty low powered, especially compared to what we have today with like 2019, 2020 Magic cards. So, yeah, exactly. And Kaladesh was like rooting standard, right? Kaladesh was one of the strongest sets in history of Magic, and then it just rotated it out and left like a really big gap. Oh yeah, one of the... So I'm gonna talk about the meta in a second. No, not Shadows. Yeah, it was Amket and Kaladesh, I think. With the Scarab God and like energy cards. Easy. So, just to tell you a bit about the format, as I mentioned, we played Team Sealed. So Team Sealed was Guilds of Ravnica. And that format was actually pretty straightforward, right? Um, because Guilds of Ravnica is really structured towards like five types of decks. You had like Golgari, Dimir, Izet, Boros, and Selesnia. So it was really easy to find like how to build your Sealed Pool. You usually started like a really fast Boros deck and then you build some kind of blue deck either Demir or Izet, because both were really, really strong. And then you just put all the other strong cards in a single deck, because Selesnya and Golgari were, like, so weak in sealed and in draft that you never really wanted to, like, split them up. You wanted to have them in, like, the same deck most of the time. And then the metagame for standard was actually relatively diverse. We had mostly five decks. Yeah, I actually enjoyed that one, too. We had five decks dominating the format, right? The first one, as we mentioned, is this black-green Golgari deck, basically grinding out, like Walk of Walker, gaining you life, becoming, like, dominating the board with the Explore creatures that gave you some, like, card advantage and bridged you to the late game. And then you had, like, Reaper and Chupacabra and Karn to gain, like, mid-game advantage. And your finishers were Carnage Tyrant, Vivian Reed and Fine Finality, which were both like, right now I'm not even sure they would see play in Standard, but they were like the best things to do in the format. Vivian specifically was just such a strong card, like it was so hard to kill, it got up to 6 loyalty when it came into play. It had the minus to like get rid of annoying like removal spells or just like threats in the air. And the emblem actually came up a lot of times. Yeah, basically sir, basically. Um, because, the, like, Demir and Izet ended up being so good compared to what green cards could do that you just never wanted to split, like, the green cards, the green guilds. And you ended up usually with, like, three colors, Dirtle, Rares deck, if you had luck. If you didn't, you just had, like, medium uncommons and your deck really sucked. What we ended up actually doing is, um, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, like, we had an insane seal pool, Team Israel, 
So we ended up playing Boros, Izet, Dimir. So we just didn't play the green cards because our decks were that good. Like we had Niv Mizet, we had Balzarek, Shaka was playing this insane Boros aggro deck. Um, and I had a really cool controlling tempo-ish Dimir deck, which ended up um, being really strong for us. So standard, just to, I don't want to get like too much into the decks themselves. I just want to give you a brief like understanding of how the format looks. This is probably the best deck in the format, followed closely by mono white aggro splashing reinforcements. Basically the deck plays 16 one drops, a Danto Vanguard, which is one of the best like two drops for white ever. I, I need to see if I can pop them up, because I'm not sure they exist anymore. So, Adanto Vanguard, Banalish Marshall and History of Banalia for like, top end of the curve, followed closely by Heroic Reinforcements, which was good enough to splash in this aggressive deck, alongside with um, Loxodon, which is one of my favorite cards ever. The Convoke with the plus one percent counters like usually happen on turn three or four. Um, and this deck was just like putting pressure on you. The black green deck had probably a decent matchup versus this one, but it wasn't clear cut and it like was a really, really interesting matchup with Tokati on regard in the sideboard for specifically that matchup. Now, following closely this, we had variants of like Drake decks, basically Crackling Drake, Enigma Drake, and Niv Mizzet being super strong features that want you to play a lot of cheap spells. This is the version Shaha was playing. Um, it was a bit different from a version that won the Star City Games Open, like two weeks before that or something. Yo, Ryan, how are you doing, mate? <laughs> Thank you for joining, special stream poggers. <laughs> Good to have you. So, so this, uh, so this was like a weird like tempo control deck where the deck could play a long game like really easily, but it turned the corner super fast. I mean, Drake's usually attacked for like six, seven, if not more on turn, I don't know, five, six. And that's really fast, especially when these cards were like, like the Crackling Drake just draws you an extra card, Enigma Drake costs only three, and you had to dive down to protect them, made this deck like super resilient and pretty difficult to play against. Now, two more decks that were running around, one is the Jeskai deck, just Jeskai control playing Teferi and playing Niv Mizet. This list is a specialist, which I'm gonna leave, um, leave for later, because this is what Arno was playing, and we're gonna have him on stream really soon, I hope. And then the last deck in the format that was like the the rogue choice to beat on Golgari was Selesnia Midrange, basically playing a bunch of token makers and then March of the Mulder Dudes with um, Flower Flourish to, uh, to close out the game, like big attack for like 30 damage easily. And then you get around like Walk of Walker because one blocker is not enough and getting life is not enough. Mono Red. Yeah, this standard was awesome, sir. I agree. Mono Red. So can I find this deck somehow? If I go like this. That's me. I'll show you I'll show you one of the deck. Word Magic Cup and the Gigolfit. Mono Red Midrange was a thing back then. Um, and we actually played one in the quarterfinals. This was Shu Ming's list. I hope I'm not butchering their name. So this is basically like a bunch of big rare, big rare cards. Chain Whirler and Darfi Daredevil and Siege Gang and Phoenix. With like the really interesting thing about this deck being the Stars of Extinction from the sideboard, which were MVPs in like the Golgari matchup. Just wiping the board of everything, including Tyrant and Vivians, because this card deals 20 damage to all creatures and planeswalkers, was so backbreaking. So this was a really, really sweet deck that I actually ended up playing, and I'm actually going to go over one of these games later. So, um, just to show you a bit of the sealed format, I'm going to show you round one, some of the, like a feature game from round one, which, surprise, surprise, had Team Israel in it. We actually got to play, like on feature match, the first round of the tournament, which is completely bonkers when you think of it. Like, think of me, you know, not a casual player, but I never played a big event in my life. And suddenly I'm in the World Magic Cup, sitting next to Shachar Shenhar, who's playing Kenyuki Hero in the feature match. 
I mean, put aside all like performing well and like playing versus good players, just the fact that I got to be in the feature match and my parents got to see me play on camera was amazing. Like I was, I was blown at this point. I was ready to like, yeah, paper magic fog. I was ready to call it a day and go home really because that was like so good. Yeah, it could be a big event, I guess. Yeah, look, mom on TV. I mean, you're kidding, but my friends all saw that. Like, my friends were actually holding a draft at the same time, and they had me on like the big screen in the house, which was really sweet. They had us, right? So, I, I want you to see this game. So, Shahar is playing an aggressive aggro, ag an aggressive Boros deck in Seal versus Yukihiro's. Selesnia deck, but it's not exactly Selesnia. He has black cards too. Which one's me? I'm Edgar. This is my my last name. And the, this is the classic start, right? You play one drop, two drop, removal spell, keep attack. But it's gonna go south like really fast here. So Ryan, did you actually? Did any of you actually get to like participate in nationals? People in Israel usually it's like seventy people in nationals in Israel. Bigger events could get up to a hundred, I guess. And what you can see in your pro hero's hand is that he is actually... You never did, Ray? Why is that? Yeah, so, so I remember I having qualification for nationals. Now, look how this goes like south for Shahar, right? Suddenly, Kral Harpooner just changes the tide on the board. His opponent is still at 15. And he's not going to win this game on the ground. I wonder if I can... Yeah, I can probably speed this up a bit, right? Because I have this. I just want to show you how like, how cool this format was. So, in team events, there was a play... Oh, I see. Yeah, I had to play some like weird drafts just to, just to be qualified because I wasn't really playing regularly. I was just playing like PTQs, which were twice a year, and that's it. So I had to do really well in PTQs. Yeah. Oh, I need to silence this. So... In team events, I don't know if you ever play that much, if you ever play them, you have to choose seatings for players. So, like, Zuckerman, Yuval Zuckerman was seat 3, Shachau was seat 2 in the middle, and I was seat number 1. This means that Shah we chose this, like, seating because Shachau could help both me and Yuval while playing. You are allowed to do this in... Um, in team events. Okay, now look at this. This is the interesting part. So, Shahar is getting attacked for five. His opponent has, or for, for nine, my bad. His opponent has a 4 4 and a 2 2 on defense and is on 11. And Shahar has a 3 3, a 2 2, and another 2 2 in play. Not much, right? So, this is only, this is seven damage assuming no blocks. And now I think it's where the magic happens. Robel Belt Boar, MVP. I mean, that card was actually pretty good in the format. No, it's not that one. It's the centaur that's like, it costs five. It's a 4-4 four, four Vigilance and it has Convoke. Oh yeah, crazy. So I played like, because we top aided this, I qualified for the PT, which was actually Mythic Championship 1. And I wanted to play Golgari, but then Crazy's came out and I just couldn't, like, I couldn't grasp that mirror match for some reason. So Shahar is playing a 3-3, which has um, a 3-3 with Mentor and passing the turn here, dying next turn. Yo, Water, how are you doing? <laughs> Welcome to the brag stream. Shahar is super behind here, right? But he had a really cool card in his deck called Cosmodronic Wave. Cosmodronic Wave. Basically, the mid range deck of the Japanese team kind of being a little bit deeper, a little bit bigger. I'm gonna skip a bit ahead here. You can hear he's thinking about his attacks. Thinking about his attacks a lot, because I'm sure Yuki Hero is considering exactly that card, right? Wave basically stops opponent like from blocking for a turn, which means Shahar right now has 3 plus 1, so 4 here, 7, exactly 11 damage back. But I think he has to block something here, and this block has to be like a chump block, because otherwise he would take 2 in the air, go down to 6, and then take 7 more. So Yuki Hiro is thinking he's safe here. But here's what happens. Shahar is chump blocking 
Oh, oh this is actually, I think, a 1-1 one, one maybe. On the 4-4, four, four, and I'm tapping. Oh yeah, Wave was insane. Wave was so good. And then he plays his fifth land, which is crucial here. Plays Wave. Killing a creature, which doesn't matter, but just preventing blocks. And then he's using the cheaper side of... How, how is that card called? The split Boros card, which is like one side, one mana pump for plus two plus two, the other side was like a lightning helix for four. Yeah, intervention, integrity, thank you, thank you, chat. Integrity, yeah, that one. And Shahar just steals that game, which is insane. So this is me here sitting, you know, you can see me here, you can see me here, that's really nice. And <laughs> easiest win of our lives. <laughs> I mean, Shahar had some really tight games in this tournament. <laughs> yeah, so I actually want to talk a bit about like, oh, is... Okay, sweet. Arnaud's going to join us really, really soon. Okay, Arnaud, just, just call me when you're ready and I'll have you online here and we can start talking. So I'll leave this running in the background, but I actually want to talk about preparation for this tournament, right? So... As I mentioned, I won Nationals and you Val got runner-up, which is pretty amazing. And and we contacted Shahar and we decided we want to meet in Barcelona. This happened in Barcelona a week before the event to test. Now, um, we actually tested a bit before that, not much, but just enough for me to decide that I don't want to play like the Drake's deck. Yuval was pretty firmly on like the mono white splash red deck. And and we ended up like just, you know, getting to Barcelona, knowing the formats, talking to Shahar a bit before, but not nothing, you know, super intense, right? Because we just didn't know what to expect and how to like actually prepare better. And we hit Barcelona and we meet Shahar. And I don't know if any of you got that feeling ever, but like when you when you had like not BFF then, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the thing is that we, we, we got to Barcelona and we never met Shahar before. And, you know, I've seen him play, of course, like Shahar is famous around the world and especially in Israel, you know, because he, be him being like the only Israeli pro, but I just won nationals, right? I felt like I was on the top of, on top of the world. I'm a really good player. We're going to take this tournament. It's going to be like, not easy, but we, we can do it, Right. And then we show up to Barcelona, we meet Shahar, we talk a bit, and like day one we don't test much. We just like talk about sealed a bit and go to sleep. Wake up the following day and it's time for some serious testing to happen. We had a really lovely Airbnb, really, really fun times. And Yuval and me starts playing um, Golgari versus Boros Agro, like standard matches. And we end up with this enormous battlefield. I think I have a shot of that actually. We end up with this insane board that, um, yeah, okay. We end up with like an insane board which has like two Wild Golf Walkers with like eight and 15 um, counters on my side. I am at like, I don't know, 50 something life. Yuval has like nine or 10 creatures in play. And we just don't know how to handle the board. And Shahar just steps in and like easy as that, just dissects the board and like analyzes it in a way that makes me realize like how much better he is than I am. Um, that was like, it's not even a level up moment. It's just a moment where you get to understand how much better the pros are than like the average player. And I feel like I was like, then I was above average, but it was still like miles ahead of me. I just sat there baffled. I was like, okay, I can learn a thing or two from this guy, hopefully a bit more than that. And, and that's where like the real testing began because it wasn't even Shahar testing much. It was mostly like me and Yuval practicing, Shahar helping us improve and get better, both in sealed and in standard. And I think we learned a lot like from that week of testing. Like I would for sure not be the same player I am now, if not for that week. Yeah, that was, 
Yeah, that was humbling. Yeah, that's just like the right word there, sir. Um, and having this opportunity and like beyond that week, we actually got to play alongside Shahar for like the entirety of the tournament, which ended up stretching three days. Osmos what does what does osmosis mean? I am not familiar with the word. Got a second here. I am not familiar with the word. So and we got to play, so we got to both test with Shahar and we got to play with him. And playing tournament magic is really different than testing, obviously. So if in like the week before I got to learn a lot about the game itself, during the tournament itself, I got to learn about how you compose yourself and how you approach competitive games of magic. I think it was one of the first times where I actually grasped, grasped like how focused you have to be and how like how um, in the zone you have to be to play like really, really good and win really tight games of magic and not let like variance or bad luck or tilt get to you oh i see no i did not so like diluting i i hope i did not dilute his ability to play magic <laughs> i think evidently i haven't because uh he had i think a decent year as far as i remember i i think it only works like the one way around right which is probably good <laughs> Good question though, good question, sir. You're on point today with your questions. <laughs> He's got some, yeah, Shahar definitely does. Um, he, he picked up the Drake's deck so fast. Like, I think he played like three matches and then he was, and then he like already understood like how the deck plays out and how to play it and how to like pilot it to a really high level, which is obviously pretty amazing. Um, so actually, so another, Quick story before we get to the tournament itself. Oh, Ryan, I think that happened in a GP, right? I think I saw that video, it was pretty hilarious. By the way, I miss Paper Magic so much, just like the manner is, like just handling the cards is so much fun. <laughs> Look at us, the advantage bar is on our, is on our side here. So, I was playing, as I mentioned, the black green deck. Oh yeah, Nexus of Fate was not okay. I was playing this black green deck, right? And as you can see, this deck had Karn Sign of Versa, two copies in the main deck, and two copies of Dryad of the Cowl. Now, this, this specific variant is Brad Nelson's variant. He wrote about it in like, on Star City Games, like a week before the tournament or like a few days. And we decided that this is probably like the variant that I want to play, but I never got to actually test with this specific version except for one time. So the day before, the day before day one, we decided we were not gonna be testing anything because you know, we need to chill a bit, we need to relax before the tournament, prepare rest. But I ended up waking up early. So I just like, you know, fired up a league on Magic Online and went like a very, very fast 03 with the deck I was playing the following day for the biggest tournament of my life. That did not feel very good, let me tell you that. Um, but I did just like, you know, I just said, okay, it happened. It's fine. <laughs> we don't need to tell anyone about this. I never actually told Shachar and Yuval about this. And I was just like, oh yeah, this is, uh, it happened. We're going to forget about it and it's going to be okay. <laughs> I mean, I think at that time I was also really new to Magic Online. So I tended to like time out a lot and like grasping the battlefield. I don't know if it happens for any of you, but like, the skills for understanding, like analyzing boards on, um, like in paper and online are very different, at least for me. This is what makes Arena a bit difficult for me right now. So I think that was like, this was to blame to an extent, but like it happens, right? You just have to fire it up and uh, hope it's good. <laughs> so that, was, that wasn't like, you know, extremely, extremely, uh, an extremely positive experience. It is rave. That's interesting. I don't know which one's more draining for me, but you said you don't play that a lot, right? By the way, this is me bidding and Niv a resolve Niv Mizzet in draft, in, uh, in sealed. Just concede, just attack for two more. 
Yeah, I'm trying to figure out like how to set up my no, this is not what I wanted. I never I have a bunch of things open like in the background, so just a second, I'll be Oh yeah. So yeah. Um what else did I wanna tell you about? Oh yeah, okay. So one more one more funny story before Arnaud joins us is this. So we play this feature match, right? And I can actually show you this here. So we play this feature match, game one, round one. And I'm super excited. And then like after the match, we actually end up winning it. And I talk to my friends and they're like, well, that was really sweet to see you like win on, win on camera, but check that one, check this out. And, oh, you can't actually see this, right? Let me pop up the photo then. So you know how they have these photos of like these stats about every player when they show up to the feature match? So these are the stats we had. We had Shahar at 60% lifetime win percentage, which is great. And then me at 25%. Now I'm looking at it and I'm like, how is my lifetime win rate 25%? Just like, I'm not an amazing player, but it has to be more than this. So it turns out this only counts proders and GPs. Okay, just a second. Hey, can you hear me? Hi. Okay, everyone, please welcome Arno Hockmeter. Did I get it right? Hi, yeah, almost. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, nice Who is to... um, joining yeah, us for this very special <laughs> special stream? I was just telling them. I don't know. Just let me set you up here for a second. I don't know if you ever saw that. My. Why is this? Showing that. Oh, I think I know why this is happening. Okay, got there. So I was just showing them this photo, which is basically um, Wizards posting my lifetime win percentage, which ended up being 25% um, lifetime win percentage as my stats. And this is because these percentages only count like GPs and PTs. And up until that time, yeah, I played like two GPs and went like, I don't know, one eight in like cumulative in GPs like three years before that. So that's the only stats they had, which is a bit embarrassing, but like a really funny story to come from that event, just having like this stat on, on screen. So All everyone, right, welcome, um, Arnaud. Because the focus is so small. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll turn up, I'll crank up your volume a bit, I think. So um, thank you so much for joining. And do you want to introduce yourself for a bit? Um, just tell us like where you come from, what you're doing, how you want the uh, WMC. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm a magic player, competitive magic player since uh, 2011, 20, like some, something like that. Um, I live in Paris, France, and. Uh, I work as a web developer uh, since five years, and I've been playing so competitive magic for a while, um, doing GPs in Europe uh, mostly, and then I won uh, nationals in 2018. So that's what allowed me to compete in the World Magic Cup with Team France, and that's what uh, brings us here tonight. That's sweet, yeah. Um, so you were actually, you were national champion, and like me, you were national champion forever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, then... yeah, because they come from nationals as well as the World Magic Cup. Yeah. So. So, so I was just talking about, like, Team Israel's preparation for the event, like, my experience with that. And I think you had a pretty different experience for me. Because as I mentioned, um, and we talked about it yesterday a bit, like I didn't really know Shahar beforehand and I never actually played like a PT. I played only two GPs, as I mentioned, when I was really young. So for me, it was the first big event I played. But for you, it was different, right? Yeah, I played 
uh, something like 20 GPs at the time, maybe a bit more. Um, most of them in Europe. And I've played a lot of photo qualifiers at the, t at the time, they were called PTQs. And I've qualified for uh, four PTQs, I think, at the time. Um, like one each year in tw between 2013 and 2016. So I've already played in, uh, in like uh, many tournaments and I had, I had a, a, yeah, I had experience of, of the, uh, what you would call the big stages. Uh, <laughs> so I wasn't, um, I wasn't that much uh, stressed about or impressed about the, the w, WMC, and that would be that would that would have been different if that was my first uh, big tournament. And actually, our 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 third uh, teammate, Timothy, uh, he only played one pro tour, so that was his only session. one, right? <laughs> yeah, and he was a bit more uh, stressed about it than. Uh, the brown eye that so, we did um, our best to just a second um i don't know uh -huh. someone is just saying that like they have a hard time hearing you maybe you can like i don't know if you have a microphone or you can maybe um like get closer to it to talk a bit louder maybe that will help um i don't know is it better like this i don't know if you can like uh turn up my sound only in your yeah, on your Discord. As much as I could, I think. So we're gonna let, let's go on and like chat. Tell me if this is not good enough, and we'll try to do maybe something a bit different. But um, All right, I have a very uh, yeah, I have a bad microphone on my computer. I can switch to mobile if you need, but I don't have a a webcam on my. So. Okay, let me... Do you think maybe we should do that? Maybe we should switch to mobile and then you'll have better sound? Yeah, if it's not better we're like this, uh, we can switch to mobile. So, but sir, can you, so, so chat, can you understand now? Like, I know it's a bit echoey, but I think it's good to have, uh, to have our nose webcam here too. So it won't just be <laughs> a voice talking from the void. <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, maybe maybe it's better if we switch to the mobile. Do you think you can do that? Yeah, sure. All right, uh, I'll be right back. I'm okay, sorry let's about set this up. Inconvenience. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, no problem. Discord is a um, tough mistress. So I'll disconnect from this for a bit. But thank you for letting me know, sir. Um, that's really important. Like, as a streamer, I don't actually know how everything sounds to you all in chat. So, like, if you ever see something wrong, photo not showing, me blocking something, my, my mic is muted or like, just let me know. It's better to know about the problem than like ignoring it. So let's wait for her not to call us back in a second here. And then uh, we're gonna have a floating voice. I'll, I'll probably, um, while we're at it, do something like this. So let's, do this, let's do text. No, this is fine actually. Okay. Yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Right. I mean, it doesn't do, like, it doesn't do any of us good if, like, we have a guest and no one can understand what they're saying other than me. It's just not, that's just not helping anyone, right? So it's good that you let us know. I'm gonna actually put, um, let's actually put this in the background. This is the first time France um, crushed us. Okay. Okay, first hey, welcome France. back. Hello. Uh, hey, okay, this me? sounds much better to me. Oh, you can't hear me maybe? Okay, great. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. I was just putting on our match in the background, like the one in the Swiss. Well, not exactly Swiss, but like before the top eight. Okay, sorry about the inconvenience. Uh, yeah, sure, this wanna, is much better. If, if, if you want me to, do, to talk again about the, 
background of the pre presentation. I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, so we were talking about that, like the fact that you already played like four PTs before that, you said, right? Yes, uh, my first one was in 2013, mm -hmm. and I was I was basically only playing modern at uh, at the time um, because this this was my favorite format. So every year you get uh, you get a PTQ season which was in modern mm -hmm. in, uh, during summer. And the other PTQ seasons were standard and sealed. So I was only playing the modern one. And I managed to qualify almost uh, each year in the modern season. So that allowed me to play one PT each year uh, wow. until 2016. That is so I had. <laughs> Thank you. But I mean, the, this was the only format I played. So. <laughs> uh... <laughs> what was your specialty deck? Uh, in modern? Mm hmm. Uh, I played basically, uh, first it was um, Buffing Pod, so I played Meteor Pod uh, and Kiki Jiki Pod. That was uh, the deck which I made my first GP day too as well. And then I played Splinter Twin, Amulet Bloom, um, I mean basically every deck that got banned and so at some point. So I switched deck uh, whenever they banned one, went to the <laughs> other and then they banned again. So. And at some point, I switched to standard because they banned every deck I love to play in modern. So that's it. <laughs> okay, yeah, playing playing the deck that like ends up getting banned every time sounds like a good plan to me. That's where <laughs> yeah. I aspire to be in Magic, in competitive Magic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but this was your first um, World Magic Cup, right? You didn't play that before. No, uh, the year before uh, 2018, so in 2018 I won Nationals, but in 2017, which was the, the year they brought Nationals back, mm -hmm. uh, I went on to play the Nationals as well and got to the top eight, but uh, lost in the semifinals oh. uh, due to a critical blunder from my side, so I was devastated with that. So I could very well have played the, the year before the, the WMC, but didn't because of that. That's heartbreaking because like if you get it, if you get past the semis, like the finalists both go, right? So you basically lost the finals. Yeah, I was up a, bit, up a game and very far ahead in the second game, and but finally lost. And uh, yeah, that was a hard pill to swallow, but I managed to come back the next year and finally, <laughs> finally won and go to the WMC. So, so how did you all prepare? Like I thought, I think you told me you also came to Barcelona like a week earlier, but I'm not sure what you, like how did your preparation go? Yeah, uh, we planned our preparation uh, in advance because uh, I already knew uh, Jean-Emmanuel Dupra, which uh, who was uh, the French captain. So we started testing Team Seal in Paris like one month before the WMC, and because we wanted to focus on standard uh, as um, the uh, the much later we could, because like standard could be changing. And Team Seal wasn't that much changing, so we started testing Team Seal before, mm -hmm. and then when we came in Barcelona, um, we only tested Standard here. Uh, that was uh, the Monday before the World Magic Cup, so four days in advance. Mm -hmm. And how did you? So you had, I think, both a really interesting seating like arrangement and interesting deck choices because usually what happened was that the like you know the pro point leader the captain of the team was in the middle so he could help both of his sides like that's what we did and then like you know the classic decks of the format were like an Ivmiza deck a Boros deck and a Golgari deck but you ended up on a slightly different configuration right? Yeah basically uh, every team was playing a Golgari deck we mm -hmm. knew like all the team were, would be uh, having one Golgari players, and the the other two seats would be most likely one white aggressive deck, which could be either uh, Winnie White, Celestia tokens, or Boros Agro. 
<laughs> and so yours was yours was Boros Arrow. Yeah. And the third seed would be what we called a Steam Vance deck, which could mm -hmm. be either J Sky Control or uh, is it Phoenix or is it Control or is it Drakes? But that was uh, the the kind of decks. So uh, yeah, Dupra was very good uh, with Golgari. So that was uh, the, the luck on the Golgari player uh, minute one of the of the format, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then we had to we had to choose the other two decks. And uh, the, the, we had a very good uh, JSKY control build, yeah. uh, which was des which was designed by the, the French players for the GP Lille one month before the WMC, I think. Um, because, I mean, it's a bit of a longer story for that deck, but <laughs> we we created a Discord with all the French players who, who were planning on playing the GP Lille. And usually we test with like five or six Parisian guys for GPs, but for this time we wanted to do something more um, bigger. And basically we welcomed uh, any anybody who was French and willing to play the GP. So we ended up with 40 or 50 oh, players wow. uh, collaborating on the Discord for that GP. And we ended up uh, finding two good decks, which were uh, Golgari and the Golgari like, that basically everybody had for the GP and the J Sky Control. I mean the yeah the Sky Control that you are showing here. I mean oh mm -hmm. what became this deck uh, for the WNC. But the the point of having many people uh, testing together. Is be, uh, because this was um, at the beginning of a format like uh, Gives of Remika just came out, yeah, and and we needed we needed uh, to get innovations because if you are only five or six, you have a very very hard time uh, finding new decks. You're very good at testing uh, a mm -hmm. format with which is already known, but you have more trouble finding new decks. So we needed innovators, and then we could uh, test the decks they would be finding. So we got very interesting decks and the J Sky we found was actually really, really good against Golgari midrange because you don't have any creatures, you have be you have uh, many mass removals and yeah. you have a combo kill which prevents them from looping Carnage Tyrants and basically uh, you have inevitability in the mid game. So that's uh, that's why we chose to play this deck uh, for the World Magic Cup as well. Uh, the, de the deck didn't do quite well at the GP. I went uh, 12 and 3 with it. <laughs> didn't and, do quite uh, well 12 and 3? That sounds good to me. <laughs> no, but, yeah, it's, I mean, it's very good, but the, we were like crushing Golgari with it every mm. round, and we expected uh, to put at least one player on the top 8 with it. Oh, but, I see. Uh, it was but, the classic yeah. case of like the deck being so good that just like top sixteen <laughs> just doesn't count, right? You're yeah, really but I, I, went, uh, I went I went thirtieth place, I think. Nice. And a, fr a friend of mine went eleven and four, and so we had like yeah, eleven, twelve, ten wins maybe. So which is really which is good, of course, but we needed to be to tweak it more to tune uh, the deck. A little bit more for the World Magic Cup, so we wanted to play that, but couldn't find the, the third deck in our uh, combination for the unified standards because mm -hmm. uh, Mono Red was needed uh, Lava Coil as well. Yeah, and, and Star of really... Extinction too, right? And which card? And Star of Extinction? Uh, like the 7 no, mana mass the... removal, right? No, uh, uh, Star of Extinction is more for Monored uh, control. Uh, I meant uh, Monored aggressive. Oh, you meant Monored aggro. Okay, okay. My bad. Yeah. But, uh, and Winnie White or Boros weren't that good during our uh, uh, testing. So mm -hmm. we had trouble finding our last deck. And basically, at the la last day, we. Oh, really? Uh, we looked again for uh, a deck which, which could be compatible with Golgari and Jeskai and, and found the, the Celestia tokens deck uh, who did well. Uh, and I think like one or two players automated the Japanese GP the week before the World Magic Cup. So hmm. we found that deck who 
should be good and so this was our third choice and we were very happy with it at the end so this was like a last minute audible right i really thought you just broke the format because i think you had like by far the best combination of decks for this for this uh, meta game that we ended up playing <laughs> uh well thank you uh, i think yeah the this guy build was uh, very unique and very well positioned because uh, it's very good against the Golgari and there is actually 33% uh, of Golgari in the field because of the uh, Team Trio uh, side of the tournament. So, but the Celestia, I mean, we found it like uh, maybe, yeah, half a day or before the the deck list submission, so we had mm -hmm. a little bit of time to finish uh, that deck, but yeah, it was very good position as well, and the other teams found it as well. So, and how it, it was a good choice in the in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was really good choice. I felt like as the Golgari pilot, I felt like the Selesnia matchup was super tough. And... Did you have Did you have a um, additional sweepers in your sideboard for this matchup? I had like a couple of golden demise. But that's not all much. right. All right, all right. I think the the matchup is. I don't know if it's. I don't remember if it's supposed to, to be favorable for Golgari or not. I, I, I just know yeah. Team crushed me twice. Uh, <laughs> that's what I remember basically. <laughs> yeah, but he had really good draws on. <laughs> yeah, but so. yeah, I'm but not sure about. That. So, how did your day one as a team go? Because what happened for us was actually dreamlike. We got to play like. Feature match versus Japan, like round one, and we won that, which was amazing. And then we just like went 3-0 in the sealed, um, in the unified sealed, because our decks were completely busted. And we yeah, won. I saw, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, our decks were like not <laughs> okay. Um, but then we ended up playing um, Portugal in round four. I actually got to play versus Marcio Car Carvalho. Like he was on oh, that's, the same front nice, of me. Yeah. yeah, in the mirror match, in the Golgari mirror All right. match. Which is probably like my most memorable experience from that, like from the entire tournament. I mean, except for like the result, getting to play like such a big name pro on camera, and like I actually beat him with the help of Shahar. Was oh, all right, good game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good that job. was like my probably like my most memorable experience from that tournament. So how did like so our day one was pretty, like. No problems, we just cruised today too. But how did you do? So I was a bit uh, worried about the team seed part because we were very confident about the standard portion of the tournament. So mm -hmm. I just um, I just wanted to to escape the seed portion with <laughs> a two win record because uh, we had to play three rounds of sealed and if you manage to go only one and two you basically needed uh, to go three one in standard because uh, four three uh, was I mean not uh, you you weren't sure to go to day two mm -hmm. with a four three record because the cut was to top 32. Right, so, right. It wasn't a so, clean cut. Okay. Yeah. So if you go one and two in the seed portion, you start with the bad tie breakers, and so basically you have to go three one, mm -hmm. or even three and zero oh maybe, because three one can sometimes not do it. Yeah. Uh, for top th thirty two. So, and actually, I'm not very good in limited. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> I was a bit wor worried about that part, and but uh, luckily um, my teammates uh, carried in the seed portion, and we went on two and one. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I was <laughs> really happy about that, and then we played against uh, United States in uh, round four. Ooh. So so I played against uh, Seth Manfield. Ah, that is sweet. Who was in Golgari, and he, I think he didn't know about the fight with fire combo. So he was a bit uh, surprised when I killed him with that uh, combo in game one. He, oh, wow. he, called, he called the judge to make sure that was actually working because 
uh, expansion only targets a spade with converting mana cost four or less, and so I wasn't sure about the kicker part, but that works because the kicker doesn't change the mana cost of the spell, which is still uh, free. And so basically, I so we won against uh, United States and States, and then won the following round as well. So we went four and one and finished uh, our day. Yeah, so uh, this structure early, was like... But not, not as early as you. <laughs> <laughs> One more round. Because the structure was a bit weird. Like once you got to four wins, you stopped playing. You just don't need to play anymore. You just pass to day two. And then if, as you said, if you end up like 4-3, like if you were 3-3 and won the last round, then there was a cut for like day two. And then, yeah, for the top 32, because that way you can divide the 32 teams into pools of four teams. So then cut to top 16, then cut to top eight. Yeah, yeah. Because they made and then it was like double elimination twice. Yep. For the... So our day one, so our day two didn't actually... Okay, just before we get to that, I actually want to show one more thing here. So... As I mentioned before, like my, a big part of the WMC for me was just like beyond even just like winning a lot and getting to represent the country. It was just like the individual experience was for me something really unique. And I, I will never forget like this part after this match, after I played Carvalho on round four on camera. And I think they showed like all of our games, like Brad Nelson, the one I was copying his, like I was copying his list, right? Was like all tweeting right. about me doing a great job and like we don't need more like good standard players like you should stop doing like just like um giving compliments and that's like coming from a player of this status was just so big in like building up the confidence that we had as a team and of course for me like as a magic player um oh whoa, that's great i didn't notice the, that yeah that from him, but yeah it's very it's very it must be very nice to hear yeah, it was really, really nice. And it's like, I'm not like, I'm a bit, I'm saying this a bit as a like bragging, but not really bragging. It's like, it's just like a really big part of this experience, like showcasing new players and like giving opportunities to like places that maybe have less PTQs because in Israel, it's really hard to make it to PT because we only have like two PTQs a year or something in the old system. And like this was probably okay. the biggest like stepping stone you could get, humble brags. Yeah, Chad is saying humble brag. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, you, yeah, you have the right to brag if you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a uh, this is nostalgia stream, so this... we're fine with that. <laughs> yeah. I said I I was talking to someone um to Rabe I think to one of my um to someone in chat here before, and he was saying this is like my brag stream. So I said I'm gonna have you here to keep me on the ground. Because like at the end, like we just lost you in the finals, so I can't brag that much. So our day two was like not as smooth sailing as day one. We went like two one to finish like the first double elimination. So we ended up like going to the next stage and then we went like one and one and had to win another match to top eight, um, which we ended up doing eventually. But that was like not smooth sailing like day one which made us like they a, a lot more like stressful for us um but it was as i said like a really good experience we got to play you i think in round two um, yep, in, the, the in the second stage yeah in the second stage or in the first one no second stage in there the was stage. the the run photo beta right already oh so oh so when you beat us you actually got a top eight. that's pretty cool yeah so we actually yeah, lost to you and then had to win like another one. Yep. So did you do like 2-0, 2-0 and just into the top eight like this? Or did you have more of a rough day? Uh, no, we went 2-1 uh, in the first uh, pool stage. Uh, we almost got uh, eliminated at that point. And mm -hmm. um, I... I personally lost my first two matches of the day so maybe i need oh, wow. some time to wake up but i wasn't that much <laughs> confident in the in the third uh, in the third one but uh thankfully i i played better in the next ones and so we won the third rounds and made so two one in the first pool stage and proceeded to the second one 
where we won the first round and then the second against uh, Israel. So mm -hmm. we went 2-1, then 2-0. So how did you... So team events are unique in that you can lose the first, like you personally can lose the first two rounds, but your team wins and you go yeah. on, right? <laughs> but at, like, it's really disheartening, right? Losing, like having the feeling that you get carried by your teammates, like you're not contributing enough. So like, how did you handle this? Did it even bother you in like the first, like in the beginning of the day? Because it's a really rough start, to, like lose your first two matches when your teammates are winning. I don't know, for me, it would have been really, I would have, I would have felt like I need to prove myself and that would might have made me like play worse or something because I was trying yeah. to prove a point. Yeah, I can, uh, I can understand that. Uh, uh, for the, uh, since the beginning of the tournament, I mean, we talked about it uh, previously mm -hmm. with uh, uh, all the team. And we said that, yeah, I mean, we knew it was a team tournament and we didn't, we didn't have to feel bad if someone's losing uh, or someone's winning, but the other two are losing. It's part of the team structure and it's mm -hmm. the same uh, when you lose a match to one, you won a game and then you lose, you lose the other two. That I mean that happens. Mm -hmm. So we weren't, uh, we, we made sure to, to handle this uh, as much previously as we could and uh, from my point of view yeah I mean I was I was really sad uh, about losing my first two rounds because we because we almost got uh, eliminated but uh, thankfully my teammates won uh, their match uh, in time so we went uh, one and one in the in the two rounds I lost myself and then I I regained my confidence back for right in time and we won the, the the last round to proceed to the next stage. So yeah, uh, it's it, it's super interesting uh, that you actually like talked about it as a team beforehand because it's something I think a lot of a lot of players in general neglect, like the the mental side of the game and like allowing yourself yeah. to make mistakes and not judging yourself too much. I think I feel that's like a really big part of magic that's like not talked about enough. Yeah, of course, and I I believe the the level the level of play is very tied to the level of confidence you have. Mm -hmm. So we try to get to the maximum level of confidence and to, uh, as I said, our third player wasn't that much uh, mm -hmm. uh, experienced as we were, and he was a bit uh, stressed about the. Event, so we tried to give to give him uh, as much as confidence as we as we could to make sure he was playing to the best of his abilities. And we also about the team structure. We uh, you can talk to your teammates and sometimes give them advice. Mm -hmm. But we so we talked about this uh, prior to the runs as well, and we said that we weren't going to communicate. Oh, wow. Because most of the time, I mean, most of the time, uh, you want to communicate because if it's a team event and you want to help your teammates if you can. Mm. But uh, what we what we uh, saw in the previous team tournaments that is that you uh, you are not as well informed as your teammate about the game he is mm -hmm. playing because. He has been playing the game against the same opponents uh, since like 20 minutes. And if you just jump in the game and try to give an advice, uh, most of the time it's not uh, that well informed. So yeah, we, we, yeah, we just said um, no communication unless you specifically ask for it. And we try to keep that uh, only to mulligan decisions or cyber decisions or specific questions like uh, is he playing this card? Can he have this card in hand? What am I supposed to play around? And so no, not like uh, um, only specific questions and uh, no uh, uh, advice, advice about like the game plan or something. You are, uh, you are supposed to trust your teammate and they play their game. Mm -hmm. So you only answer to specific questions. Yeah, that's really interesting because so I, I want to say like two things about this. The first is that this 
I definitely understand this from like a streamer perspective where I will play a game and like people would be hanging in chat and like watching the same game, maybe even from the like the beginning. But because I'm actually playing the game myself, I have a better feeling for like the flow of the game and how is it going and like what like, I have some more intuition about what my opponent could have and things like that, which like people who are watching the game but not playing it might easily miss. And, exactly. And, and But for us as Team Israel, like the skill gap was much bigger because as you mentioned, you were both like, both you and team played PTs in the past. You actually had like a lot of good results before that. But for us, like Shahar was, as I said, miles ahead of us. He was playing a lot more competitions. We almost never played outside of Israel. So Shahar actually helped us a lot. And that's where like the, the team portion of this event was really coming in handy for us because like, I think up until the, up until like the semifinals, every round we won was like Shaka winning one and then me and Yuval winning one. But Shaka was okay. like carrying us really hard and he was helping us play at the same time. Okay. And he was playing a really tough deck. So it was like, it was actually a really, really big thing for us because we communicated a lot. And actually when we shouldn't have, like I really remember a point in the quarterfinals where I was like trying to say something to Shahar, but obviously he knew what he was doing and I was just interrupting him. And that's like really, I was really like, okay, maybe I should take a step back and just let like the pro player make his decisions because he's in this game and he knows what he's doing. So that was like a really interesting part of this event for me. And it's interesting to hear that you had a really different experience for what we did. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, that's the point. If you ask uh, uh, for your teammates, most of the time you, you will be interrupting his train of thought. So mm -hmm. maybe what you're gaining from his advice uh, will be losing in his personal game as well. So just so that's that's why we try to communicate as um, uh, the minimum possible. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Especially when you're all like that, that um, confident in your decks and like yeah. But it is like as some as Sir is saying in chat, like this is a really hard line to draw. Because you could think like someone is missing something and just want to help them, but obviously you could harm them. But like, is it for the best of the team to like not communicate here? So I think it's really impressive that you actually like managed to put that off. I think it's like, it's showing how good the chemistry between all three of you was. Mm, yeah, I mean, that was important to talk about those things in advance and to make sure we were on the same page on that questions yeah for sure so how so what did it mean to you to like top eight that event i could actually show we have like the profiles here I could actually pop yours up um what did it mean to you to to top eight this event as you know a team that like came from like a really strong country you already had good results in the past in this tournament right this was your second win of the event not only top eight and yeah it's Team France uh, won the World Magic Cup uh, previously in 2013 uh, with uh, Rafael Levy as a captain and uh, mm. three, and uh, two good friends of mine in the team uh, this year. Uh, so we wanted to do as well as they did. And uh, the year they won the World Magic Cup, we basically, uh, I, I was doing a stream uh, with the, I was streaming their matches, but with the uh, French commentaries. Oh wow, that's really cool. With okay. a friend. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> they so yeah, the World Magic was uh, already something special in our country uh, because of that that year and because of the previous years and most of the time, uh, every player who is qualified in France is uh, known from the whole community. And the team uh, usually gathers uh, help from the other uh, competitive players in Paris or in France in general. So uh, for this year, we had the help of uh, several players uh, who were qualified the previous years. So they helped us prepare for the team part uh, from the specifics of this tournament to select our decks and so that kind of stuff. Yeah. Wow, so did you feel any pressure to like, um, 
to succeed in the event because we as team israel you know we came we hope to do well but like no one was expecting us to do well we could have <laughs> like you know had a medium result and go back home and everyone would be proud and like nothing wrong but did you feel anything different from your side um yeah a bit because uh yeah at least a bit of pressure because uh we as you said uh friends already did well in this event and as i recall myself every year i was watching the world magic cup i wanted to see the the french team doing well i wanted to mm. know if they were winning or not and so i yeah i thought we had to do good results to make uh the other french players proud of us um but past that uh, past that feeling we were just very um confident in our testing in our deck list in our strengths so as soon as we entered the tournament or um, should i say the standard portion of the tournament <laughs> uh, we were really confident and i didn't uh thought about uh, this much, yeah. uh, although when we reached the top eight, uh, yeah, that was a bit more stressful, of course, yeah, of course. because uh, there was uh, really um, tense games, especially in the semifinals against Italy. Oh, so, yeah. I actually wanted to pop something up there because I just, <laughs> I was watching some coverage to to like get some uh, info for today and i caught i caught that moment um your match versus Mangucci, game three semi-finals right you're like tied in matches and in games so like whoever wins this just wins like goes on to the finals and then yeah and I, you, like, you can see your excitement in how you move the cards here. Like, to, do, do you want to tell a bit about this moment? Because this is kind of epic. <laughs> yeah, of course. So uh, against Italy, we... So I was pleasing in, uh, against Mengucci. Uh, so we won the, all three game ones. So we were leading 3-0. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then they won the following four games. So they completely reversed the score and we are leading 4-3. So we needed to win the last two games. So, mm -hmm. uh, so at that point, uh, Dupra started his game three and I started mine. So mm -hmm. I was playing against Mengucci on Gulgari and Dupra was playing against Celestia Tokens. So as you can see on stream, uh, the game of Dupra w lasted for almost 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I was watching a bit of that game. I was like, how long did that game take? It just doesn't yeah, end. I think I th yeah, I think 44 or 45 minutes. Yeah. You can you can check on the timestamp, but yeah. it's all it's longer than 40 minutes. So so the the match was already uh, up for almost an hour. No, yeah, 45 minutes at that point. So we were we already played one game each. So and you, and you me... weren't playing right. Like in future matches like this, they tend you to wait until the outcome of that match, and then you can play right. Yeah, but they knew the games would go long, so I started at the same time as uh, Jean Emmanuel started his okay. game, so <laughs> mine lasted uh, 45 minutes as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so those were really, really long games, and every five minutes I was looking in the right, and so how is the, uh, Jean Emmanuel Dupri doing in his game? And <laughs> oh god, he still hasn't won, still tense. So that was really. <laughs> really long game for the both of us but uh, in the end we won uh, almost at the same moment yeah I'm just, yeah i just popped up the stream like to the point where like they moved to your game and it's turn i don't know 15 or something yeah it's you can see the size of the graveyards i have like almost 30 spells in my graveyard so yeah i yeah i must have like 10 cards left in my library <laughs> So, so for that was, how long have that you was been really... playing for like that win? For like Fight with Fire with double expansion explosion? Oh, you mean in, in this game? Yeah, in this game, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, that's well, a, oh, that's I... an extinction event. A Star of Extinction. 
Ya. Harus. Uh, I have very I have a very small memories of that game because it, it wasn't a stream for the um the most part of it wasn't a stream but yeah. I just recall that um I mean against Gregory you ju- you just need to answer all of their threats um uh, one by one mm-hmm. and this match went very long because he had uh He has a lot of recursion uh, engines like uh, fine finality. He has a memorial to folly, and he has a lot of ways to gain card advantage like Vivian Reed, yeah. Calm, um, J Light Rangers. So uh, the game can go very long, and I had to use um, my fight with fires and expansion explosions to gain card advantage or to mm. just like answer to a threat on board so that's why the game went so long because it was presenting a uh, uh, endless stream of threats and I had, to, I had to answer he had answers to my teferis as well mm-hmm. so I had to maneuver uh, with uh, it was it was very um, difficult to get an advantage in at some point and but uh, finally I get yeah. to <laughs> answer his final threat i mean i think he has like i don't think he has much in hand uh, anymore at the yeah i think he's holding like a couple of cards but he has the eldest reborn like this is gonna get another carnage tyrant at some point or maybe like your teferi or something but it doesn't matter because you just have 30 damage yeah which was yeah, one but, uh, like I've been, I've been working on this one for like two or three turns for, <laughs> because I couldn't. Uh, I mean, I was going to be decked at some, at decked at some point. So yeah, and you have to actually win in time, like to you actually yeah. win before you like you lose your cards. I remember, like when we played versus you the first time. You know, in the like in day two, we did not have deck lists, so we basically um, like when Shahar just died to the to your expansion like fight with fire. It was like. Okay, that's bad for us. We're not sure how to handle this. And then uh-huh. in the top eight, we actually got to see your list. And we just realized okay. Shahar just doesn't have a way to solve like that combo. Because Shahar was playing um, disdainful strokes in the sideboard instead of negates, because those cards are like better for most of the matchups. But it doesn't stop the combo. Because Fight with Fire still has converted mana cost of three, and expansion on the sack has converted mana cost of two. So I think we literally had no way to stop the combo from going off. So we knew that matchup outside was of super spe- tight. Yeah, outside of spell, spell pierce. I mean, which which is good against a uh, yeah. nine mana spell, but but yeah. like once you and once you know about it, it's so easy for you to play around it unless you have like unless we have pressure. It just felt like mm-hmm. a really bad matchup for us. Um, well, well, that's that's interesting because uh, as you said, we uh, the the deck list. Uh, I mean, the deckist knowledge changes a lot uh, mm-hmm. in the way you play the matchup. And I yeah. remember when I first played against Shoha as, uh, as well, I I mean, I would have played very differently. I mean, I played very differently the second time I played against him because I had the, I had the knowledge of the list. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, it differently and I played differently because of that. Of course. Oh yeah, that's that was really interesting for us too. So for us, in like it mostly was relevant in the quarterfinals match, I think, um, because let me pop that up for a second here. I was playing versus mono red, mono red mid range, like mm-hmm. the deck with like the star of extinction and stuff like this. And because we had the deck lists, we knew they don't have star game one, so I knew I could just play all into the board. And then okay. for like game two, and we knew they had like four bane fires, so I knew to play around that, and that like really changed the dynamic of the match, um, which is really really a unique element to top eight of big events, or maybe just big events now that they have open deck lists. And I really enjoyed that part because analyzing the deck list was super interesting, and it made the matchup feel more, more complicated but more interesting at the same time. Yeah, exactly. And the first time I played against Shohar, I was wor- worried because I thought it was a, it was a bad matchup. Mm-hmm. But after seeing the decklist, I thought it was like I don't know, maybe fifty fifty or a bit favorable. I'm not sure about that, but definitely winnable. And yeah, yeah, 
because I was less, I were, yeah, I was less worried about the answers he could have because I knew exactly what what I was up against. So, yeah. So, tell me, like, so okay, that, let's go to the finals, right? Let's go to the finals of the event. I know it's always hard for me to watch that video, but we're gonna do it. This partially. <laughs> Um, I mean, to be honest, it wasn't that, I mean, losing the finals obviously su stung, but way to play it, it was just, at that point, the, like, the accomplishment for us as a team was so big, and for me, like, it was definitely the, the biggest thing I've ever done in Magic, so it didn't sting as much, although, um, like, in retrospect, I'm sure I would have, like, preferred to win, like, at that point, we, we weren't, like, at least I was pretty happy with how we performed. But tell me, like, tell me how you felt about that win. I know it meant much to you because I think you're the only country to win the WMC twice, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that's a good question. Uh, as I said, we, we were confident in our uh, abilities and in our decklist so we knew he had a very good shot in uh, once we made the top eight to win the events but then i yeah we tried to stay out of any outside of the game considerations and not think too much about the uh the title the money or anything uh, mm -hmm. like that so and when we won the when we won the finals, and I was, I don't know, I guess I was a bit shocked, or I don't know, it, I took some time to realize <laughs> that we actually won it again for France. So I guess we, we realized when we came back to France and people were um, very happy for us, told that, tell us, yeah, they told us that they were watching the streams and wanted mm -hmm. us to sign cards or uh, some things like that so it was a really cool experience as well yeah so i wonder if this happened for you too for me because we we were really lucky because we got to be on the feature match a lot twice in day one and i think we we're like the backup feature for day two at some point and then the top eight so i had a lot of obviously like friends from magic watching but also just like random friends of mine who don't play magic and like family members who know nothing about magic just watching the coverage and cheering on us and i think that's when i realized like how big this event really is because for me the wmc always felt like something that's really nice to have but not that meaningful um which might be tied to the fact that israel never did super well in the wmc but once you do well like once once you get to experience it yourself i realized how big of an event is it is for like the country itself, especially if like the magic community is pretty small, this like puts you on the map. So that was really the moment that like solidified to me how important the World Magic Cup is for magic as like, I think as a game that wants to be to appeal to like everyone in the world, basically. Yeah, of course, because the, the, the World Magic Cup speaks uh, a lot to people who don't play magic. And if you just like uh, win a Grand Prix or mm -hmm. something like that, it's great, but it doesn't uh, speak that much to outside the Magic people. So, yeah, I think the World Magic Cup uh, speaks a lot uh, by itself. And uh, yeah, just like you, I, just like you, I had my family watching the stream. I had some uh, work colleagues watching the streams and friends from my school uh, back in the years watching as well and tell me that they played a bit of magic when they were when they were young again and mm -hmm. didn't know that was playing but just randomly popped on the stream and saw the French team doing well so yeah there was some great moments as well so what was your most memorable moment from like the tournament and like I'm saying this and I'm saying not the, except for the win itself, which is obviously probably <laughs> the most memorable moment, but that's the easy answer. I want the tough answer. I want you to tell me what like was the, the thing you remember the most from like the tournament or the experience. You 
Mais yeah, the, okay. the, the team experience uh, with friends was obviously great. Uh, I mm -hmm. do love team tournaments and play team GPs whenever I can. Um, and about the the World Magic Cup itself, uh, I think that yeah, the it felt like a pro tour, but that you can play with uh, your friends or sometimes just like people from your country and so and you're representing your country so that means the like every round you go to fetch your little flag that you mm -hmm. bring with you at the table and then play against another country so the um the country part of it was felt yeah much more special like when you play in the gp or in the pro tour you play against american people or japanese people but the nationality doesn't matter that much and in its events it's, it's all about it because you play country against country so that makes you proud of winning for your country so that was a, I think, yeah that, that was a great part of it and about the yeah like the nice like the the fact that you're playing for you representing your country just puts just makes this much more special because as you said like it's not like playing a random American on the GP, you're like France versus the US, and not in a bad way, just in a way that like this is the way to like represent the country and that meant a lot for me as well in this tournament. Um, that you you made me remember like the little flags we had we carried around mm -hmm. from table to table. And like just all the support from home and like the whole community really supported us as well. Um, we didn't really test with other people, but we did have like, we definitely felt the support. People like rooting for us and like putting, you know, cheering us on Facebook and on like the Discord and stuff like this was really, I think, the most important part of the experience. Other than like being able to, to experience that whole tournament with like the family and friends as well. Like, the community yeah. support was just amazing. Yeah, that felt a bit about like, the Olympic Games, in a way, where you're uh, competing for medals for your country, in a way. Yeah, just a second here. Just hiding something in... Um... Oh, I can, I can do... Oh, no, it's mm -hmm. not hiding anything. Okay, yeah. So anything else you would want to add about the tournament? I think I think I told my stories, right? <laughs> um, yeah, like the finals were, as I said, um, at this point, like there was almost no pressure. We were just playing like to try and get the win. But it felt like we did so much for us that like just getting there was amazing. And obviously for you, the win probably like meant tons. And yeah, so do you have like anything you want to tell us more? Um. um well on the day we on the day of the the top eight yeah. um the matches were uh, not played uh, simultaneously but one by one to for mm -hmm. them to be able to show every game on the stream right. so mm -hmm. we we arrived at the with everybody at the tournament all at eight or eight thirty i think and then we were only playing the third quarterfinals, which was around 11 or 11.30. So we had roughly three hours. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we, we had to wake up very early, earlier than the previous days. So yeah. pack up everything, went to the tournament hall, and then wait for three hours to play our actual first match. So in this, in this meantime, we had to... Um, eat, of course, but we had to get in shape for the match, test for our mm -hmm. um, quarterfinal matchups to make sure we had the correct sideboard plans um, based on the deck lists we had. And then we started, because we had much more time, after that we, uh, we began to plan uh, for our potential semifinals matchup, which would be either uh, Italy or Austria. And we had some friends in uh, Paris on the phone who were testing as well oh, for our uh, semi-finals match because we were uh, probably... I mean, if we, if we were to play against Austria, they were playing uh, Turbo Fog in the seat C. So oh, we right. Had, we, we, had had, to, mm -hmm. 
yeah, so we had to figure a, a plan and the side of plan for this uh, particular matchup. As we, so I was watching the stream, and uh, Dupra and Timothy were playing the matchup and or figuring out the side of plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the friends in Paris were uh, testing as well the matchup for us. But uh, yeah, thankfully Aust uh, Australia lost because I don't think our Slisney player would be able to beat this. And we <laughs> got to play against uh, Italy in the semifinals, which uh, was uh, a, a way more uh, manageable uh, matchup. Yeah, I mean, that Turbo Fog deck looks really, really awful matchup for Golgari. I guess they built it just like to specifically beat that deck, right? It just looks um, so tough. Did they have? Oh, they didn't even have reclamation. Oh, did they have reclamation? They didn't. No, 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 no. This was before reclamation. Yet. Reclamation was the following set. It was um, Ravnica yeah, Allegiance, Allegiance, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's a sweet innovation for such a tournament. It mm -hmm. it takes a lot of confidence to submit this list for like a big tournament as that one, right? Yeah, of course. That's taking. But they did well with it, so um, yeah, yeah. Props to them. Yeah, absolutely. I think these kind of tournaments really uh, reward innovation if you if you do it right, like you did and like Austria did. But then like you could easily like lose a couple of matches because you're playing a suboptimal deck or just not facing the matchups you wanted. So it's really punishing as well. Really high risk, high reward. Sweet deck though. Forgot about it completely. Yeah, I mean the the waiting time between the matches were so difficult at times. Right, because yeah, um, and <laughs> they like you're about to go to game three, but they're telling you wait, we want to show game three, so let like let this match end, and then you're just sitting there, and you're just like waiting for someone to win the game, and it's a uh, it's a special part of being on coverage, I think, because it doesn't happen for like the rest of the teams in the like, yeah. they're not on coverage. Exactly, and then we had to wait. Uh, I think like two more hours and then play our semi-finals against Italy which lasted for I guess an one hour, hour and, and a half, half. Right? <laughs> and then we immediately went on to the finals <laughs> without I mean with like two minute break before that mm -hmm. and I was playing again against uh, Shahara with, with who has probably one of the very best players in the room mm -hmm. so that, that ball was a bit, a bit stressful of course yeah, easy game, right? Though just uh, just play one of the best players in the world for one of the highest <laughs> matches you ever. That's the fun of it. That's what I'm like. That's the real thing that pulls me to tournament magic is those matches where you have to play like strong players in tough matchups and you have to play super tight. And yeah, game. that that yeah, that's part of the of the fun too of the experience as well. Um, so yeah, I mean. You kind of expect to not play against big players, but it's you expect a bit to in a way because you wanna you wanna play against great players yeah. and mm -hmm. tense matches as you said. So you wanna you wanna play against great players, but not every round because otherwise it would be too difficult. <laughs> yeah, and you were the you were seat like you're the middle seat. You probably played the most like pros in the tournament from your team, right? Because most people had like the pro in the middle seat, as I said. Yeah, yeah, that was the plan because we expected a lot of team captains to be on, on good Gary. So we wanted to put on the middle seat uh, the deck who had the best matchup against Gold Gary. So that's that's why I chose the the middle seat for this event. Usually, I prefer to be on the on the side, and I was actually on the side for the sealed portion, but. In the in this turn, the, the portion I just took responsibilities and <laughs> went on to the middle seat. <laughs> well, it paid off. It paid off. Yeah, yeah. I played against uh, eight. Yeah, eight Golgari in ten rounds. Holy, that's a lot. That's like so. You played five matches on day two. Did did you play eight? Oh, you had yeah, you had more matches on day one. Wow, that's that's insane. Playing eight of like what ten matches you played in standard versus Golgari. 
probably yeah, like and the, easy mode. At yeah, and, the, and the, uh, the last two matches were against uh, Easy Drake's uh, Shaha. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, everybody else, every other team oh, we wow. played was against Golgari in the middle. So I th yeah, I think we had a bit of uh, luck in the pairings, of course. Yeah, I also think you got like you just got rewarded for preparing so well for the tournament. Um, I mean, talking to you now, like I think we prepared almost as best as we could, but you obviously like went a step, like you took another step in that direction, and you had like really tuned deck lists, and you had like you you got rewarded by playing versus like your best matchup, and yeah, that was that's really impressive. I really think you dominated that tournament, that's like the feeling that I got from playing you and seeing you play, which was really sweet to watch, by the way. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think we prepared uh, well, and that was, yeah, I was very, uh, I was very happy that the, the preparation paid off because when, uh, I mean, most of the time when you prepare for a GP or a PT, you uh, you test for a week and then, yeah, I mean, sometimes in Magic you lose uh, and yep. I would say most of the time you lose. I mean, mm -hmm. you cannot win all the time. So most of the time you just prepare for a week and then just lose. So it feels really good when the preparation pays off and you actually uh, win because of your good preparation, for sure. So before we finish, you we talked yesterday and you told me you are working on a project on a new website and Twitter about like MTG data, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, do you want to talk a... about that for like a second before we, we finish the day? Because sure, it looked sure. it, it was it looked really cool to me, and I want to uh, showcase this a bit if I can. Um, so that's a project I launched with my uh, good friend uh, Remy Fortier. Uh, who I've been playing with for the past four or five years, I think. Uh, we're both part of the Parisian crew who's playing GPs and sometimes PDs. So we've been working on um, getting better at Magic for years. And mm. I mean, pro players have many times to dedicate to playtesting, but we don't have that much and in a way we are not as good as they are. So we wanted to mm -hmm. get better at uh, testing methods and so doing what we do in our professional lives, um, doing that same kind of stuff in Magic to get uh, better at testing. So. So that's, I have to say, this is remarkable from someone who's like, you played more than a few PTs, you won the WMC, Remy Fortier is a PT winner, and you're still just trying to improve all the time, which is really, like, I think it's the best attitude you can have towards competitive magic, but it's really hard to do. So that's, like, amazing to me. Yeah, of course. The I mean, the worst results that I've, get, I've got in magic are the tournaments. Uh, who were right after a big win or a big performance because when you win at Magic, mm -hmm. you think you're the best. And sometimes it's good because it boosts your confidence, you're mm -hmm. playing better. But if you think you're too good, you don't take that much time to test or to prepare or to you just become a bit lazy and too much confident. Mm -hmm. And so you just get worse uh, in that case. So you just need to um, focus all the time on your play level. And so about that, we did, uh, I mean, for, for the, the first Pro Tools we played, we were just like hanging with some friends. I mean, the, the other qualified people mm -hmm. and then jamming some games during the week. And at some point we just said, okay, I'll be playing that deck <laughs> who wants to join me. And yeah, now that I think about it, the, the first two or three protos I played where we were just when very we were just very bad at testing and mm -hmm. we just played random decks we which were very bad even the, even though we had the I mean the tier one deck list we just didn't want him to play them uh, for no reason 
and just testing tested very badly. So we when we when we got back to the proto with Remy in 2016, that was for Proto Kaladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a, we took things very seriously. We went to um, build a team with 10 or 12 uh, qualified French players. Did a, like two weeks boot camp with very wow. uh, professional playtesting methods. Uh, so we went. We had each day we had to test a specific matchup and then write uh, a note about how the matchup went to be able to tell the other people in the team mm -hmm. why this deck is good, why it's not good, how the matchup could be better, what are the winning scenarios in the matchup, and so on. So we tested for two or three weeks with that um, methods and did a very good job at, uh, at I mean, finding uh, a good deck and like understanding very good the formats. So we went on to um, get better at testing, uh, preparing for the events. And after the or um, like all the tournaments were canceled in uh, March or, or April. So there was uh, there were uh, lockdown in France, so mm -hmm. we couldn't play um, as much as we wanted. But we still uh, thought about uh, improving our methods. And that's when the online GPs came out. So oh, we, mm -hmm. yeah, we suddenly had a big, uh, big uh, bunch of data coming from the GPs. So we had the deck list from the events and uh, every the result of every round so we could just uh, yeah, you, you register could just the runs mm -hmm. and see like oh how every matchup went in the event so that's yeah that's how we build this kind of uh, winner matrix based on the events uh, who are played so now everything is run on mtg melee so there are uh, channel fireball tournaments star city games tournaments so every week now you can uh, play big stakes tournaments in arena and qualify for the mythic invitational with uh, that kind of tournaments so no we just um, we look to provide uh, data to the uh, matchup data because most of the time when you test in magic you just test the matchup and think like okay this matchup seems positive or negative or, but you don't know for real how the matchup is supposed to uh, go mm -hmm. and with with that kind of data you can you can see that okay so uh 200 people have played the matchup this week this have played this specific matchup this week and they went uh 55 percent for to die or any numbers that you can see in the in the line uh, of the deck you want to play and mm -hmm. then see if the deck is well positioned or not in the current meta game. Yeah, that's really amazing. I mean, I'm looking at your data. I, I started looking at it uh, yesterday when we talked about it and it's like really amazing. I'm definitely going to look, take a look at some more standard data um, because mm. I've been playing the format more now. And that seems like a really good tool. And I actually might hit you up at some point at like advices for testing because I'm not doing it correctly for sure. <laughs> and I think that's yeah, like sure. A, hmm? Yeah, sure. No worries. We can talk about it if you want uh, at some point. But um, yeah, that's the the kind of data we are um, gathering and uh, for at the moment. But we are looking for uh, much more in the future. We want to provide, uh, of course, deck list and um, we are, yeah we basically want to help people preparing for tournaments and choosing the right deck list, the right archetype, and the, the right cards in their deck list based on the win rates we got from the previous weeks of tournaments. So that's the, the point we are uh, heading towards. That sounds really great. So um, we have your link in chat. So if anyone wants to check you out, I would recommend doing this. We have some great info coming from here. And I think this is uh, where we end the stream. Unless you have anything else you would like to add? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's about it. That's the, the yeah. um, story of the World Magic Cup and now yeah. we're on the hope, MTG data, which I is where... I hope they bring it back, yeah. Like, hope maybe at some point we get to defend our national titles and you get to defend your WMC <laughs> title and we get to challenge you again. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome to meet again uh, in that kind of yeah. tournament. Also, just having uh, the wonder. tournament... I think we talked about it, how good it is for Magic as like a game as a whole and for like communities in particular. I think that's really great. Um, yeah, I wish they will bring back those kind of tournaments, especially nationals. Um, yep. but because every year that was the... Um, yeah, there was, this was basically the best tournament of the year because it was, yeah, okay. uh, it was almost free and every player in the country would come back to play in nationals. Even people who weren't playing that much, weren't playing GPs anymore, they would come back in nationals because they knew every player they would be there. So everybody was there. Yeah. Uh, nationals were just nationals. a big event for to meet people, to play like the best players in the country, to prove yourself. And mm. well, COVID kind of kind of stops us from doing this now, but I hope they return it in the future. I hope they they give it back to us. And if yeah. not, maybe we maybe we'll create our own nationals. Who knows? I heard in Sweden yeah. they do it already, which is really sweet. So, yeah, some countries they can do can do that. Uh, between uh, twenty yeah before twenty seventeen, so they, they they bring back nationals in twenty seventeen. But uh, in twenty fifteen, I think uh, there was a nationals uh, a third party nationals organized in France. But oh, wow. that wasn't uh, mm. that wasn't uh, yeah anymore in 2016. But uh, so, yeah, I hope they there will be a official national uh, back uh, soon enough. But no, we are not having GPs for almost a year. So <laughs> yeah, I hope things get better. We have vaccine. We have a vaccine. We can maybe we can maybe start um, getting tournaments back. But. Well, we can only hope and do our best to stay safe in the meanwhile, I think. Exactly. So, so yeah, you can play on Arena and on Magic Online or, and of course, uh, follow Amit's streamer uh, whenever he's online. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining, Arnaud. That was so much fun. Really well, so much fun. It's good to talk about... Uh, the uh, yeah this kind of memories uh, yeah that should have been a great uh event for you as well and uh, i yeah. was really pleased to talk to you again and hear about your stories from that event like for example i didn't know you played against japan in round one and beat them <laughs> yeah yeah we so, had yeah it was a good stories it was insane tournament this was just yeah an amazing experience and you had i i loved hearing your stories too because you know, I thought you had the Selesnia deck prepared in advance and apparently, you know, you just um, like audible in the last moment. And it's like just really cool stories. Also, the way your team prepared was so much different and like your your whole like chemistry was different. So it was really cool to hear. So again, thank you so much for joining. That was really fun. I hope we can maybe do more things like this in the future. Um, but I think for today, this is a... Uh, this is the end of the stream. I'm going to pass you all in chat to Martin's stream. He's playing some modern. And again, huge thanks to Arnaud for joining this and huge thanks to everyone who was watching. Uh, have a great night. Thank you very much to you.